Hello, good day everybody. My name is Dr. Sanjay Sanya. This day, this time I decided to create a different kind of video and call it the surgical anatomy of the abdominal viscera. I'm a professor of surgery and neuroscience and here's my video. What we did, we picked up a specimen from a cadaver and we extracted it and this is what you see in front of you, which I shall tell you in a little more detail as we go along. So to bring you up to speed, here we have sections of cadaver here. So this is the cardia of the stomach, this is the duodenum, this is the stomach, this is the spleen, this is part of the ascending colon, transverse colon, the descending colon, and the greater omentum. In order to lift it out of the cadaver, we had to cut in four different places. You can see them marked by this small cross here. We had to cut it in the region of the cardia where the forcep is inserted. We had to cut it at the duodenum. We had to cut it at the terminal ileum, and then we had to cut it at the junction of the descending colon with the sigmoid. And then we lifted it out of the cadaver. So this is the specimen that we shall talk about in a little more detail as we go along. So let's start with the first structure, that is the stomach. Let's take a quick look at what we can see here. So this is an enlarged view of the anterior surface of the stomach here. So this is the cardiac end of the stomach, the cardia where the forcep is inserted. This is the region of the fundus of the stomach, which is in relation to the left dome of the diaphragm. And just adjacent to the fundus and the greater curvature of the stomach, you can see the spleen here. So this is the greater curvature of the stomach, and this is the lesser curvature of the stomach. This is the body of the stomach, the anterior surface. Don't mind these creases and grooves here because these are all preservation artifacts. And the, the body of the stomach continues as the pyloric antrum, and then it continues as the pylorus and into the duodenum, which has been removed from this specimen. The, attached to the lesser curvature, we have the lesser omentum, which has been removed here. But we can see that attached to the greater curvature of the stomach, there is still a part of the omentum. And this is actually a part of the greater omentum, which I shall tell you a few slides later. This part of the greater omentum, which extends from the greater curvature of the stomach to the transverse colon, is referred to as the gastrocolic ligament. The, remember, the word ligament here does not apply to the term ligament in the true sense of the word. This is just a fold of peritoneum. What we can see is that within the greater colic, the gastrocolic ligament, we do have multiple numerous blood vessels. These are the gastroepiploic arteries. We have one gastroepiploic artery running from left to right, that's the left gastroepiploic artery. And when we have running from right to left, that is the right gastroepiploic artery. The left GE artery is a branch of the splenic artery. The right one is a branch of the gastroduodenal artery. And as they run along the folds of the gastrocolic ligament, they give off numerous gastric branches to the greater omentum, and we can see all of them here. So this is about the stomach here. One more point, if we make a section of the gastrocolic ligament here along the border of the lesser, greater curvature and we lift up the greater curvature of the stomach, we will enter a space, a peritoneal space, and that is referred to as the lesser sac or the omental bursa. And this omental bursa is the one which separates the stomach from the contents of the bed of the stomach, one of which is the part of the spleen, Part of the diaphragm, the left kidney, the transverse mesocolon, and the pancreas. These are the stu structures which are in the bed of the stomach. Now let's take a look at the next part of the specimen, the colon. This portion that you can see which is black here, don't mind this black portion. This is actually a post-mortem artifact because of poor preservation. This is not an anti-mortem gangrene. So let's go, try to identify the parts of it. We can see that this is the terminal ileum here, and this is the ileocecal junction. So therefore, this is the cecum that we see here. The cecum is a unique part of the large intestine, which is as long as it is wide, 7.5 centimeters in either direction. We could not trace the appendix. It may have been removed. And if we trace the cecum up, this is a part of the ascending colon here. And this ends in the hepatic flexure, which is related to the visceral surface of the liver. And then it continues as the transverse colon. This transverse colon is the one which is running here. We can see part of it here under the greater omentum. Now, in this particular specimen, the transverse colon happens to be quite redundant. Just to bring up to speed in a living person, if the person is very thin and small built, like an asthenic individual, then the transverse colon tends to be redundant and long. On the other hand, if the individual is very stout and heavily built with a very short thorax, the hypersthetic individuals, then the transverse colon tends to be more transverse in nature. Continuing with this transverse colon, we have the splenic flexure here which is related to the colic area of the spleen on the visceral surface of the spleen, which I shall tell you just a little later. And then it curves down as the descending colon and ends in the sigmoid colon, which has been removed here. 
Since this portion of the colon has been preserved, we can see a few structures here. For example, we can see the tinea libera here. The tinea libera is nothing but a thickened portion of the longitudinal muscle of the colon. And this one tinea libera, the other two tinea being the tinea mesopolica and the tinea omentalis. These tinea are named according to their relationships with the omentum, greater omentum, and the mesocolon in the transverse colon. And they are the ones which are seen here. We can also see these fatty structures here. These are the appendices epiploicae. And there have been numerous mentions in the literature about inflammations of these, and they are known as epiploic appendigitis. So this is about a few words about the transverse colon, cecum, ascending colon. Before I get out of this slide, let me point out a few things here. This is the ileocecal junction, as I told you a little earlier. The ileum is intraperitoneal. As it enters the cecum, it raises two folds of peritoneum, one above and one below. We cannot see the one above the superior ileocecal fold, but we can see the inferior ileocecal fold. And this is a site, a potential site of internal herniation. This inferior ileocecal fold is known as the bloodless fold of Treves because there are no blood vessels running along the margin of the ileocecal fold. And therefore, if an intestine gets incarcerated here, we can safely incise the ileocecal fold and extract that intestine. So that is about the colon. Now let's take a look at the next part of the specimen and let's say a few words about the spleen here. The surface of the spleen that we see here, this is the diaphrag costodiaphragmatic surface, the convex surface of the spleen. This is related to the left dome of the diaphragm and to the lower ribs, the 9th, 10th and 11th ribs. What is significant is that if we see any patient with injury to the 9th, 10th or 11th ribs or any fracture, we should always think of splenic injury because splenic injury can produce severe hemorrhage and can be life-threatening condition which may require emergency splenectomy. To continue, when we are palpating the abdomen for an enlarged spleen and we recognize the spleen by its notched superior border. So this is the superior border and you can see there's a notch here. This is what enables us to recognize that this is the spleen. Correspondingly, there's an inferior border behind, which you cannot see, but it is way behind, and that is related to the left kidney. And this is the anterior border of the spleen, which is related to, just behind this anterior border of the spleen is the, the, the colic area, which is related to the splenic flexure of the colon. On the medial side of the spleen, the so-called visceral surface of the spleen, we have the hilum of the spleen, which we cannot see, but that is the general location. And on the hilum of the spleen, we have the splenic vessels entering and leaving, and there are two Folds of peritoneum, one is known as the gastrosplenic ligament, which contains the splenic artery and the splenic vein, and we have the lino-renal ligament, which contains the tail of the pancreas. And these branches that you see here, which we mentioned earlier, the gastro left, left gastroepiploic artery, they are the branches of the splenic artery. So these are the parts of the spleen that we can see here in this specimen. Let's take a look at the next part of the specimen, and namely the greater omentum. This whole thing is the greater omentum here, the so-called abdominal policeman. The greater omentum is derived from the dorsal meso, embryonic dorsal mesogastrium. During embryonic life, it has got four folds as the development progresses. The inner two folds, they fuse and the omentum becomes double layered. This portion of the greater omentum, which stretches between the greater curvature of the stomach and the transverse colon, is referred to as the gastrocolic ligament, which I had alluded to earlier. And the other portion of the greater omentum, which hangs down from the transverse colon down to the as an apron in front of the abdominal viscera, is referred to as the greater omentum proper. And we can see that the greater the, the gastroepiploic vessels, which were running on the greater curvature of the stomach, apart from giving out the gastric branches, they also give out multiple epiploic branches. And these are the epiploic branches that we can see the greater omentum. So what is the role of the great romentum in nature and what is the surgical use of the great romentum? In nature, the great romentum, it always tries to wall off any focus of infection. That's why we call it the abdominal policeman. For example, if there's a leaking appendix, or in, it tries to wall it off so that it does not become into a generalized peritonitis. After surgery, if we are not sure about our intestinal anastomosis or any repair, we always take a patch of momentum and we try to cover it, especially after a duodenal perforation leak or something. This is to reinforce our intestinal anastomosis or a repair. So that is the surgical use. And there have been mentions in the literature where the great romentum has been strangulated when it gets incarcerated inside an intestine, inside a hernia, and then it becomes gangrenous. So that is the, these are the few words about the greater omentum. And finally, thank you very much for watching and uh, have a nice day. Thank you for letting the dead teach the living.